All right, third time's a charm. This is the third time I've started this recording outside again. And first the cat was trying to get in the door. And then there was this really loud starling chirping away. So hopefully it's further away. Hopefully I can do it this time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're back with Artist and Their Pets. And today's artist is Renee Magritte, who is a Belgian surrealist, another favorite of mine. Um, Belgian meaning he is from Belgium. Probably one of the most imitated artists of the 20th century, René Magritte painted odd things in strange places, but his dog Lulu was always where you'd expect her to be, right next to him. Although the Belgian artist René Magritte was an ordinary man and his paintings were of ordinary things, his art was quite extraordinary. Extraordinary. The eldest of three boys, René was born in Belgium in 1898. Not much is known about his childhood, but he began taking his first art lessons when he was 12 years old. In 1912, when he was 14, his mother drowned herself in a nearby river. Her body was discovered later, farther down the river. For years, René painted faces covered in cloth, which many believed was evidence that he had seen his mother's body, but he probably did not. That's very sad and kind of morbid and weird that they're like, they think he saw it, but yeah, he probably didn't. He found, uh, he found the next few years, school years difficult. And when he was 18 in 1916, during World War I, he enrolled at the Academy de Beaux Arts in Brussels, the Belgian capital. We had some other artists that went there. Magritte did not enjoy the art lessons at the Academy de Beaux Arts, but while he was there, he became interested in futurism, cubism, and purism, and particularly the art of cubists John Metzinger and Fernand Leisure. After military service, Magritte married his childhood sweetheart, Georgette Berger, in 1922. To earn money, he designed wallpaper and then posters. Good morning. In 1925, he saw the work of Italian artist Giorgio de Chirico, Chirico, Giorgio de Chirico, who painted pictures of eerie streets and strange things in odd places. Inspired by the mysteriousness of the paintings, Magritte began painting his own pictures of unusual objects in unexpected places. This is a great chapter because today is also, or this week is also surreal week for my art choice board. So Magritte's a good person to look at. You can go back and um, listen to the chapter on Salvador Dali, who is also inspired by um, De Chirico. You can see here the picture he painted, things in odd places. Um, Magritte had an exhibition at the Galerie Les Centare in Brussels in 1927. The gallery was also paying him a small income to display his paintings regularly, but the exhibition received terrible reviews and Magritte became depressed. He moved to Paris, where he met the artists and writers of the Surrealist group. In the 1920s, the research of psychologist Sigmund Freud inspired the Surrealist movement in art and in literature. Rather than painting what they could see, Surrealist, uh, um, Surrealist explored the subconscious mind. Believing that dreams could often see more real than real life, some Surrealists painted nightmare or dreamlike pictures. In Paris, uh, I'm today. In Paris, Magritte began painting his own dreamlike images, creating mystifying scenes that express the subconscious mind, and he sometimes used words and phrases as well as pictures. In 1929, Magritte painted a picture that has come to be seen as one of his masterpieces. In his smooth, realistic style, he painted a huge pipe, and beneath it he painted the words, in French, this is not a pipe. Deep. <laughs> he meant uh, it. He meant it. A, <laughs> I'm having a hard time today. He meant it is not a pipe because it is a painting of a pipe. He was pointing out that art is not real, no matter how lifelike it might look. And uh, I'll put a picture up there on the screen. The idea captured the surrealist imagination and Magritte painted several more paintings along the same line, lines that he called the treachery of images, meaning that pictures are false because they often pretend to be something real. Hmm. People can be that way too. 
The Treachery of People, a new series coming from Miss Grace. Magritte's paintings were full of interesting ideas that were admired by the other surrealists, including Salvador Dali, but they were not selling, and in July 1930, he returned to Brussels. Back in Brussels in 1930, Magritte and his brother Paul formed Studio Dango, an advertising agency. Meanwhile, Magritte continued painting and hoped that his art would, be sell would begin selling. Many birds and animals are featured in Magritte's paintings, including rabbits, a rhinoceros, and lions. Unlike many other surrealists, Magritte was quiet and shy. He believed that secrecy and unexplained ideas are more important to paint than things that are obvious, and so his art is often quite baffling. In the late 1930s, Dali introduced Magritte to Edward James, a poet and art collector who was interested in the Surrealist movement and had purchased several of Dali's paintings. James had invited Dali to London to help him decorate his new house with Surrealist furnishings. After meeting Magritte, James invited him to decorate his house too. <laughs> Come on over. Magritte stayed with James during the first Surrealist exhibition in London. After that, James bought many of Magritte's paintings. Within a short time, his work was attracting attention across Europe and America. Soon, he could afford to give up his advertising work, but just as he became successful, World War II broke out. Ugh, I have to pull my cat off of a plant because he's eating it. Excuse me for a second. Many interruptions. <laughs> During World War II, the Germans occupied Brussels and Paris, and so Marguerite lost touch with the Surrealists in Paris. To contrast with the depressing times, he began painting in bright colors. Lasting for a little over a year from 1943, this became known as his Renoir period. I'm not sure I know of that. Uh, maybe I do when I see it, but... Hmm. Once World War II ended in 1945, Magritte returned to his original style, but from 1947 to 1948, he tried another style that was messy and used quick brush strokes that was called his cow period. Apart from that, his smoothly painted, realistic-looking painting style hardly changed throughout his life. As well as painting strange situations, he also sometimes copied famous paintings but changed parts, making them quite odd-looking. His idea was to make viewers want to look closer and question what is real and what is not. Over his life, Magritte became recognized for his day-night paintings, pictures of men in bowler hats. He usually wore one, too. Faces wrapped in cloth, blue skies, giant apples and combs, birds, trains, and views from windows. To viewers, they are just intriguing images, but to Magritte, every object had significant meaning. By 1960, Magritte was world famous. He acted like an eccentric artist and wore his bowler hat when he went out walking with Georgette and their dog, Lulu. So that's a bowler hat. They're those um, round ones uh, that you'd see like Charlie Chaplin wearing. Charlie Chaplin impression. During their marriage, he and Georgette possibly had more than one dog, but Lulu became famous. First, because she went almost everywhere with Magritte, and second, for inspiring a song written by famous musician Paul Simon after he saw a photo of Magritte, Georgette, and Lulu in 1983. Simon wrote and performed the song called Renee and Georgette with Magritte and their dog after the war. I didn't know. It was a surrealistic song describing Magritte and Georgette as being fans of the music style called duop. Hmm. Let's see if I can get a little clip and play it at the end, maybe. In the last years of his life, Magritte continued working, painting canvases and murals, and making sculptures. He died in 1967, one of the most surrealist artists in the world. So I'm going to have to look at that Paul Simon song, and I think that's kind of a, a funny connection because his other song, well, he's got lots of songs, but one song, um, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard. Um, I just did a drawing for that last week, uh, and it has 
the words in it. Goodbye, Rosie, the queen of Corona. Me and Julio down by the school. Yeah. Boop, boop, boop. All right, anyway, you don't need to hear me sing it. Um, so I just think it's funny. There's a connection to Corona. Now there's a connection to Paul Simon. Connected to everything's connected. There's a string holding everything together. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, so I think um, your project that you could do, you have some options here I think could be fun. It'd be fun to do a self-portrait of yourself with something in front of your face, like this. And there's also the one where there's an apple in front of the face. So you could put something that means something significant to yourself and have it in front of your face as a self-portrait. Um, or just doing things where you're uh, changing the scale, like his paintings with the apple in the room. The apple is as large as the room, so what could you draw that would exaggerate the scale. Um, and then lastly, you could do, um, which is like one of the assignments I have on the choice board this week, an exaggeration of, uh, not exaggeration, excuse me, like a juxtaposition of things like that don't make sense where you put them. Like um, there could be a train coming out of a fireplace like Magritte's work. So what could you do that's maybe more modern in your own idea? So let's see what we can come up with. Let's get weird, draw your dreams, get weird. All right? Let me crazy eye. Renee and George have agreed with their dog after the war. Return to their hotel suite and they unlock 